So it is a pleasure to welcome uh, Elizabeth Gillespie uh, from the University of Montana, who will speak about the by construction for dynamical curtain subalgebras. Please, Elizabeth, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Gigi, and uh, thank you, Gisela, for the invitation to talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about some joint work that I did with um, a group of women. The first paper was with Anna Duvenig, Rachel Norton, Sarah Resnikoff, and Sarah Wright. And then the second paper was just the uh, with Anna and Rachel, so just the first part of the alphabet on that paper. Um, which grew out of the, uh, we started collaborating at the first Women in Operator Algebras workshop um, in 2018. And so this is fairly timely because the second Women in Operator Algebras workshop is happening next month already. Um, it, will, it will be different this time because it's hybrid, because COVID. So, but I hope it will also be fun and productive. Anyway, so, um, so let me tell you about our work on the vial construction for dynamical Cartan subalgebras. Well, let me start by just telling you what is uh, a Cartan subalgebra in a C star algebra. So if you've got a C star algebra then and a subalgebra B inside of it, we say that B is Cartan if it satisfies four properties. First one is B has to be a maximal abelian subalgebra. Second, there has to be a faithful conditional expectation um, from A onto B. And so if you don't work with those all the time, that means phi um, is sort of B linear in that the, those don't actually have to be the same B on either side. But anytime you've got a B and a B prime that are in the small algebra B, those will pull out of the, the conditional expectation phi and phi has to be linear and contractive. So in particular, phi is the identity on this subalgebra B, and it's, it's sort of a projection of A onto B. The third condition is that the normalizer of B, so this is the set of things in A, such that when you conjugate uh, B by them, you land back inside B. Um, this set of normalizers has to densely span the big C star algebra. Um, and finally, B has to contain an approximate identity for A. So B is, is maximal abelian, but it's also, it's not too far off from A. There's a lot of structural links between B and A, if B is a Cartan subalgebra inside A. Okay, so why are Cartan subalgebras important? Um, they're linked to the classification program by some work of Selchuk Barlak and Shin Li. Um, in a lot of situations, we also have, because there's this tight link between the Cartan subalgebra and the big algebra, if you've got a homomorphism or sometimes an isomorphism on, um, at the level of the Cartan subalgebras, then you can lift that to a, a homomorphism or some, again, sometimes an isomorphism of the big C star algebra. So B, it, it's abelian, it's nice, it's friendly, but it contains a lot of the structural information about the larger C star algebra. Um, and the, the reason I'm most interested, and this was, I, if I may put words in his mouth, uh, Jean Reno's original motivation for studying these, um, if you've got a Cartan subalgebra, you get a, a groupoid model for your C star algebra, or what I would call a, a dynamical model. So as I said, um, Cartan subalgebras were, I think th this definition on the previous slide, this is uh, really due to Jean Renaud uh, in a 2008 paper, but it builds on work of Kungens from the 80s that I think people said, oh yeah, very nice. And then, I don't know, got distracted and did other things. And then Renault said, no, there's really something here and brought it back into the full light of day and, and polished it up. And in particular, we have Renault's theorem, which is that if you've got a Cartan subalgebra in your C star algebra, then like I said, you can write A as a twisted groupoid C star algebra and that B, 
the Cartan subalgebra is just the continuous functions on the unit space. Uh, in fact, this, this twisted groupoid situation is unique if you add some adjectives. So there's a unique topologically principal etal groupoid and a twist over um, G that, such that B is isomorphic to the continuous functions on the unit space of G and A is that twisted groupoid C star algebra. So we often call G the vial groupoid and sigma the vial twist. So understanding this G and this sigma is the, the vial construction that I mentioned in my title. So, and as I said a minute ago, Renault's work builds on um, Kunjan's groundbreaking work from the 80s, where instead of looking at topologically principal groupoids, Kunjan was looking at principal groupoids. Um, and then instead of getting Cartan subalgebras, you get something a little stricter called a C star diagonal, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. But if you look at Kumjan's paper on C star diagonals, then there's there's a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, so we've got groupoids here. What are groupoids exactly? There's a lot of ways to think about them, but for purposes of this talk, a groupoid is just a generalization of a group in which you've got many partial units in the sense that um, here we've got units gamma, gamma inverse and gamma inverse gamma. And those are units in the sense that if I multiply on the left or on the right by these units, I get back the gamma that I started with. Um, and the trouble, the difference between a groupoid and a group is that not all pairs can be multiplied. And the ones that can, we denote those G upper two, the composable pairs. And those are the ones gamma comma eta where uh, the range of eta, which is this eta eta inverse, has to agree, has to be the same unit as the source of gamma. So this gamma inverse gamma. <laughs> Examples of groupoids in particular include groups, of course, group actions. Um, so for the group actions, the unit space, the set of units, is the space that's being acted upon. Um, and what are the range and the source maps in a group action groupoid? Well, the source of a pair x comma g, x is a point in the space, g is a group element. Well, the source of that pair is x, and then the range is the action of the group g on the point x. So I really wrote these pairs backwards. It would be more helpful if I'd written them as pairs g comma x, but then that doesn't match with this notation. So, you know, so you can't win. Um, but, and then in this setting, the inverse of a group element is, well, you want it the you want the range of the inverse to be the source of the thing you started with, and vice versa. The source of the inverse should be the range of the thing you started with. So the inverse of the pair x comma g is going to be the pair action of g on x comma g inverse. Another example of a groupoid is an equivalence relation. Uh, these are the principal groupoids that Kumjin was focusing on. Um, and so here, the unit space, if you've got an equivalence relation, thinking of, think about it, an equivalence relation on a set X. Well, think about that as just a set of pairs in X cross X. So then our unit space is X. Um, the source of a pair X comma Y is just Y, the range is, is is x and to multiply we just you know if um the y's here in the middle match up then we can multiply and the y's just cancel out and disappear and then in this setting the inverse of a pair x comma y is y comma x 
I suspect this was very much review for many of the audience, but just in case it wasn't. Um, so here's Renault's theorem again, right? If you've got a, a Carton subalgebra, then there's a unique topologically principal etal groupoid G and a twist sigma over that G so that our original C star algebra is that twisted groupoid C star algebra associated to G and sigma. And our Carton subalgebra is the continuous functions on the unit space of that groupoid. Well, there's a lot of definitions in there that might not be familiar to everyone. So um, G is a tall, if these range maps, the range and source maps that we talked about on the previous page, if those are local homeomorphisms. Um, and so let's think about what happens if G is a group. If G is a group, then the unit, which is what you get when you do G times G inverse, well, there's only one unit in the entire group. And so the range and source maps go from the group onto the unit space. And so in order for those range and source maps to be local homeomorphisms, then that means that every single point in the group needs to have an open neighborhood around it that only contains that point because there's only the one point in the unit here. So in other words, in order for a group G to be a tall, G needs to be discrete. And the same thing happens if you've got a, um, a group action, the, this um, X cross G that we talked about a minute ago. So a tall is the groupoid version of discrete. And then to say that G is topologically principal means that uh, most of the units in G0 don't have any isotropy. Most of the units in G, most of the, the groupoid elements have different ranges from sources. So to be precise here, so this set here, the set of gamma whose range and source is the same thing, that's the, the isotropy at the unit U. And so the set of points where the isotropy at the unit U is just the singleton U. There's nothing else with the same range and source um, equaling U. Those things need to be dense in the unit space in order to be topologically principal. So to be principal means that there's no points with non-trivial isotropy. This is the isotropy and saying that that's non-trivial um, and saying that this is not equal to U. But to be topologically principal, we allow some isotropy, but we need points with trivial isotropy to be dense in the unit space. Again, going back to thinking about the, the group case, the group example, um, again, our unit space is just a singleton. So the set of, but, and the entire group is that isotropy. The entire group is the isotropy, um, the set of things with range and source that unit. Uh, sorry. Yes, please. There, there is somebody raised a hand. Marco, you want to oh, ask yes. a question? Oh, yes. May I ask you a question? So the, I, um, I'm not very, very familiar to that, so I, I, I want to see if I understand it. So it, suppose you have a group point, but you, you don't, but suppose you have a, a groupoid algebra, but you don't know it's, it's a groupoid algebra, but you find a Cartan subalgebra. This theorem is telling you that you are discovering the base, the base uh, space of the group of the groupoid you, you, you didn't, so you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Renault's theorem is actually quite constructive. It tells you if you've got this Carton subalgebra, Renault tells you how to construct the groupoid G and the twist sigma just out of the, the relationship between B and A. And Renault proves that you will always get a groupoid that is topologically principal and et al. And moreover, that it's unique, that if you uh, find some other groupoid G tilde and sigma tilde that are also topologically principal, 
uh, where G tilde is also topologically principal and etal, if your C star algebra A is isomorphic to C star G tilde sigma tilde, then A is actually, then G tilde is isomorphic to G and sigma tilde is isomorphic to mm. sigma. So um, you get from a Carton subalgebra, you can build a group weight. My interest in this project is sort of going the other way, to be honest, is if you can build groupoid C star algebras for much more general groupoids, you don't need these hypotheses, topologically principal et al, in order to build the groupoid C star algebra. And then sometimes you can find a Carton subalgebra inside some of these uh, non principal groupoids. And so then you have two different groupoid models. You've got the groupoid model that you started with that was not topologically principal. And then you've got Renault's uh, groupoid, the vial groupoid and the vial twist. And so the, uh, the motivating question for this research was, what's the relationship between those two things? Does there have to be a relationship? And what we've found, and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes, is that yes, indeed, there is quite often a relationship. Even if you, if you start with a groupoid that's not topologically principal, but you happen to find a Carton subalgebra in it, then there's actually a nice relationship between the groupoid you started with and this vile groupoid and vile twist. So thank you very much for asking that question, for giving me the chance to to contextualize the research and all of these definitions and groupoids that we're talking about here. All right. So as I said, um, if you start, if you have a group that is a perfectly good groupoid, but it's never going to be topologically principal, so it's never going to be the vile groupoid. Okay. And that will, like I said, I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, I just want to talk quickly about how do we build the groupoid C star algebra. Um, if you've got a groupoid and you've got, I'm going to just talk about the etal case, which again is the analog of the discrete case. You can look, you can do things much more generally if you replace all the sums below with measures and you fuss about with har measures. And I'm just, I'm not doing that today, but you can. Um, so if you've got an et al groupoid, um, I'm going to just use this notation G lower U is the set of things in G whose source is that U. And then I'm going to make the continuous functions on G with compact support into a star algebra by convolution. And the, uh, the star is given by the conjugate of F of gamma inverse. And then I can represent this star algebra on a Hilbert space in order to get a C star algebra. So in particular, I'm going to represent it on the direct sum over all the units of the L, little l2 space of G sub u, again, representing by convolution, so that it's almost by definition that pi is a star homomorphism in, from C sub C of G into B of H. And so then I can take the reduced groupoid C star algebra to be the, the closure of C sub C in the operator norm. And, but Renault's theorem was talking about a twist over a groupoid as well, not just a groupoid C star algebra, but a twisted groupoid C star algebra. So what's a twist? It's a, a groupoid sigma, which is a principal circle bundle over your groupoid. Um, so you've got a projection row from sigma onto G, and the pre-image of any element in G uh, is isomorphic to the circle. And there's some more conditions that I am going to sweep under the rug for now, but just think about sigma as roughly G cross the circle. In fact, for today, we're going to focus on twists that come from two co-cycles, and in this case, you really do get that your sigma is exactly G cross T, 
just with a slightly twisted notation, um, multiplication. Um, so a two cycle is just a function from your set of composable pairs in the groupoid into the circle, which satisfies this cocycle condition here, that if you've got any three composable elements, so the source of eta is the range of, and source of gamma is the range of eta, and the source of eta is the range of zeta, then if I multiply gamma eta, and then gamma eta comma zeta is a composable pair, so I can feed that into C. And similarly, I could do it in the other order. I could do uh, gamma comma eta zeta is a composable pair. And so I could feed this into C. And then of course, gamma and eta and eta and zeta are composable pairs. So if I feed things into C in this particular order, I should get equality. The way I remember is that on, you've got two things on each side of the equation. And on the left hand side, you've got C of gamma and eta, which are the things that you multiply in here. And on the right hand side, you've got C of, of eta and psi, which are the things that get multiplied right there. But that, that's inside baseball, probably. So, all right. And so now, like I said, we can make G cross T into a groupoid and in fact a circle bundle. Well, let's say the source of gamma comma Z is just the source of gamma. So the source and range come from G and the multiplication is twisted by this two cycle. So in the groupoid part, the multiplication is just standard multiplication. But in the circle part, not only do we multiply the circle elements, but we also throw in that two cycle. Then sigma is a twist over g and in fact in this case we actually have a continuous section s from your groupoid onto your twist just take s of gamma to be gamma comma one of course this is not going to be multiplicative unless your cocycle is trivial by the cocycle being trivial i mean that c of any composable pair is just one so one times one equals one times one, not a problem. That's a co-cycle. But we do have this continuous topological section here. And in fact, anytime you've got a twist that admits a continuous section, then that twist is actually given by a two co-cycle, where the two co-cycle on a composable pair is just well, you take the, the section, uh, you, you do the, um, the product of the section. So section of gamma, section of eta times section of gamma eta inverse. So the, um, the two cycle is measuring the failure of the section to be multiplicative. Because of course, if it were multiplicative, then this would be one. Okay. So once we've got a twist, we can also build a C star algebra using that twist. And, and for now, given the time, I'm just going to talk about what happens with that twist um, in the case when we start with a co-cycle. So again, we just make the continuous functions with compact support on G into a star algebra by twisting the multiplication, the convolution multiplication that we had a couple minutes ago by this two cycle. And this, we also have to throw the two cycle in here to the, um, the star of the star algebra. And again, we represent C sub C of G using this co-cycle multiplication on the same Hilbert space we had before. And again, we have to throw in the co-cycle in order to get uh, the rep this representation to be multiplicative. If we were dealing with a group, so that this is just the, um, there's no direct sum because there's only one unit in a group case, this would just be a projective representation of the group. So these co-cycle 
twisted groupoid C star algebras, these are basically just projective representations of groupoids. And again, we define the reduced twisted groupoid C star algebra, twisted by this two cycle, to be the, the completion in the operator norm on bounded operators on this direct sum Hilbert space of C sub C of G. All right, so now 30 minutes into the talk, I get to um, go back to the motivation, as I said, for this research, right? We, Cartan subalgebras are these maximal abelian subalgebras in a C star algebra that have quite a lot of structural connections with the, the enveloping C star algebra A. And Renault proved that if you've got a Cartan subalgebra, then you can construct a topologically principal etal groupoid and a twist so that the Cartan subalgebra is the continuous functions on the unit space and the groupoid C and the big C star algebra is a groupoid C star algebra. But there are etal groupoids which are not topologically principal, which have Cartan subalgebras. So for example, my favorite example, this my favorite example for everything. Um, let's consider a, a two cycle on the group Z squared. So this is now a function from composable pairs in Z squared. Everything's composable because this is a group. So I'm, it's a function on pairs of two tuples of integers. So there's pair one and pair two. Um, and the co-cycle just takes e to the pi i theta for some theta in the reals and raises it to the n times j, these middle two entries in that tuple. You can check, if you're bored, I would encourage you to do that, that this is in, in fact a two cocycle. In other words, that it satisfies the cocycle condition, which I've translated here in terms of the, um, the group multiplication, which is just addition, and the various group elements. And remember again, Z squared is not topologically principal because the set of points with trivial isotropy is not dense in the unit space, right? There's only one thing in the unit space and it has lots of isotropy. So Z squared is not topologically principal, but the reduced twisted group C star algebra, Z squared twist, where the multiplication twisted by this two cycle does indeed have a Cartan subalgebra. So, so let's see if we can talk through that a little bit. Why is it that B is a Cartan subalgebra inside this twisted group C star algebra? B is here the C star algebra that's just generated by the first copy of Z inside Z squared. Well, let's first check that B is actually abelian. It's, it should be isomorphic to the C star algebra of Z, um, which is, of course, continuous functions on the circle. So if I pick two different functions in continuous functions on that first copy of Z inside B, and I do the convolution multiplication, well, the definition that I went through fairly quickly on the previous slide just says that this is F like this is supposed to be the sum over all possible things, eta of f of gamma, which is our m comma n, f of gamma eta inverse g of eta times the co-cycle. Well, all possible things is just that eta becomes j and k in z squared. All right. In order for this term here to be non-zero, f and g are only supported on z cross zero. So I need that k to be zero, and I also need n minus k to be zero. So in other words, I need n to be zero. But if n minus k is zero, then the co-cycle c of this four tuple here, it's gonna be e to the something raised to the zero, which is just one. So the co-cycle disappears. 
and I'm just left with this stand, sort of more standard looking convolution multiplication of f and g. Well, to see that um, b is abelian, what happens if I multiply in the other order? Well, I just put my g and my f in the other order. Well, again, in order for this product to be non-zero, that k has to be zero, and n minus k has to be zero, so n has to be zero. But if n minus k is zero, then again, the co-cycle disappears, and we're left with g, I mean, the same convolution formula we had before, but with g and f in swapped positions, but just doing a, a change of variable, right? Swapping out j for, say, m minus z, m was fixed here at the beginning. Now we get it to look exactly like we had before. So the convolution multiplication of f with g is equal to the convolution multiplication of g with f, so b is indeed abelian, and it's just the C star algebra of the group z, or in other words, continuous functions on the circle. Okay. But it's not enough that b is abelian, it has to be maximal abelian. And so one can show that if you pick some f that's not in b, but it, it's continuously compactly supported on z squared, then you can find a b inside your, uh, the subalgebra b that does not commute with your f. Basically what you do, you say, okay, well, if f is supported, so if f is not in b, then there has to be some non-zero n here in the second slot where f of n, f of say m comma n is non-zero. Well, so let me just take uh, b to be uh, the identity function at um, at delta at at that m, and then you check the convolution, and it does not work out the same in both orders. But I'm not going to go through that in the interest of time. Again, if you want to check that. If you're getting bored, then please do. So we can conclude that B is actually maximal abelian. The trick with the multiplication in, in the two different orders is that once you've got your F, which is um, which is, does not disappear on that second uh, coordinate, then in one of these two products here, you're going to, you are going to still get a cocycle, right? This term will not disappear. But in the other one, you the co-cycle will disappear. And so you are going to get um, so you're going to get this this non-commutativity if you add anything from outside B. So B is a maximal abelian. You can't find any bigger abelian C star algebra that contains it because of this twisted multiplication. So that's one part of B being a uh, carton. We also need a conditional expectation. Well, what does this conditional expectation do um, on these continuous compactly supported functions, which are dense in our big C star algebra, we just restrict to the, the support of B. And then again, you get, I will let you check that this definition is indeed um, it's, it's fairly clearly it's the identity on B, um, but then one has to check that it's linear and contractive and that the, um, in fact, it's B linear. If you multiply by something from B on the left or on the right, that, that pulls out of the conditional expectation. We also need to know about the normalizers. Um, one nice thing that happens with et al. groupoids is that the normalizers um, of this subalgebra, all of these continuous compactly supported functions on the group, in a groupoid in general, this would be functions that are supported on bisections. Um, these are all normalizers. So that's, again, something you can check 
Um, and, and so that makes, so the set of normalizers is very clearly dense in the reduced groupoid C star algebra. And B needs to contain an approximate identity. Well, it, it in fact contains the identity, so we're good. And so Renault's theorem tells us that we started, oh, that should be a Z squared. We started with this Z squared twisted by this two co-cycle C theta. Well, that there is now a, a unique topologically principal groupoid, which we know can't be Z squared because Z squared is not topologically principal. And there's a unique twist over that groupoid so that we get this algebra isomorphism here. What is what are the, those vile groupoid and vile twist? Well, the groupoid is just the action groupoid of Z on the circle, where now here, like I said, where um, so Z acting on the circle is um, is a tall for sure, and to be topologically principal, you need to know that the set of fixed points is. Um, the, yeah, the set of points that um, are fixed by any group element is, um, is sparse, right? It's complement is dense. Well, the, well, so what's the action? The action is just given by um, multiplying a point Z in the circle by e to the two pi i theta raised to the n. And of course, that's going to, if theta is irrational, then nothing is fixed here. And even if theta is rational, the points, the, the integers n that will fix a point z, um, there's only, you know, there's a, a very sparse number of them. Um, and so certainly if, yeah, I, I think, if theta is irrational, then this gives us, um, then this groupoid is topologically principal. This is just one of the many ways to describe the, the rotation algebra, right? So we described it as a twisted group C star algebra, but you can also see it as um, the C star algebra of a topologically principal groupoid. Um, in this case, the twist, the vile twist sigma is trivial. The original twist gets sort of absorbed into the vile groupoid. Okay. All right, so this was one of our motivating examples. As I said, there's, there's examples of groupoids where um, the groupoid is not topologically principal, but you do get Carton subalgebras inside of there, and you can sort of see a relationship between the um, the Carton subalgebra, this C star of Z, or continuous functions on the circle, and the vile groupoid. Right, we got the circle acted on by the other copy of Z, and we were able to prove with Anna Duvenig, Rachel Norton, Sarah Resnikoff, and Sarah Wright that this happens more generally. So if you've got a, an etal groupoid and a two cycle C, and you've got a, a S is a subgroupoid of the isotropy of G, right? So that means that everything in S has the same range as it has source. And if I'm thinking of a groupoid as a collection of arrows, then everything in S is just a loop. It's an arrow that starts where it ends. If S is, is not only an abelian subgroupoid of iso G, but it's maximal among those on which C is symmetric, so C of S comma T is equal to C of T comma S, then, all right, we still need some more hypotheses. If S is normal, clopen, and immediately centralizing, then it's C star algebra, the C star algebra of S comma C is Carton inside the, C, the original groupoid C star algebra. So that, that feels like a lot of hypotheses. Um, 
they're all very important for proving that the C star algebra C star of S is actually Carton. Um, maybe a lot of these hypotheses don't sound so strange, but immediately centralizing was one that surprised us. Um, the original definition in our paper is slightly different, but Anna Duvenig um, found that we could rephrase it equivalently, slightly more simply. So a subgroupoid is immediately centralizing. If when you look at um, the con, if you pick some G in the groupoid, and you look at all of its conjugates by things in S, either that needs to be infinite or it's a single point. So in other words, if G uh, does not commute with S, if this, this collection of commutators is not a singleton, then it's a very big set. And this was important for us to show that, um, that the C star, the reduced C star algebra of S was actually maximal abelian in C star reduced of G. In our, in our paper here, in, which is, was published in JFA last year, um, we proved that, well, we provide an example of a group which is, um, which lacks this, uh, where the subgroup, it's just a group, and the subgroup S lacks this immediately centralizing hypothesis, and then we do not have a maximal abelian subalgebra inside the, the group C star algebra. So just some quick examples, though, of, of things that are immediately centralizing. Of course, if your group's abelian, then that commutator set is always a singleton. So any subgroup of an abelian group is immediately centralizing. Um, there's also, if a group has the unique root property um, so anytime two different powers agree, the original group elements agree. Um, in that case, uh, G is immediately centralizing, or any subgroup S of G is immediately centralizing. But using just the first one, right, for abelian groups, we know that um, Z cross zero is immediately centralizing in Z squared because everything's abelian. So in particular, this S that we were using to construct our, our algebra B a couple slides ago, it satisfies the hypotheses of this theorem. So, so our theorem tells us that, the C, that B, that C star algebra of Z cross zero, is going to be Carton in the larger C star algebra in the twisted C star algebra of Z squared, so the rotation algebra. Okay. But we also wanted to understand what's the connection between the original group and the subgroup at, or subgroupoid S with Renault's vial groupoid. And so that was the, the focus of the, the follow-up paper, which I wrote with Anna and Rachel, uh, which is scheduled to appear in uh, IMRN this year. So if we've got a subgroupoid S of G, so that whose C star algebra is Carton in C star G, then the associated vial groupoid, so this topologically principal et al groupoid that Renault identified, you can actually describe it as G mod S acting on S hat. So what's S hat? Well, S, remember, was a, a subgroupoid of the isotropy of G. So it's really just a bundle of groups. And S hat is a co-cycle twisted version of the dual group bundle. So every fiber is just the dual group of the fiber at S. Uh, the multiplication is slightly twisted because I, uh, I did not require that the co-cycle C be trivial on S, just that it was symmetric on S. So cocycle of S comma T has to equal cocycle of T comma S. And that's important also for guaranteeing that C star reduced of S comma C is abelian. 
so you can't, I mean, since we know that um, C star reduced of S comma C is the Carton subalgebra, so it's abelian in particular, it's, it's got a Gelfond dual and, and S hat is isomorphic with, we show that S hat is isomorphic to that Gelfond dual. Um, this bundle, this dual group bundle is isomorphic to the Gelfond dual. And then you can write down the action of the quotient G mod S on this uh, dual group bundle. Essentially, what that does is it just moves you from the fiber over the source of gamma to the fiber over the range of gamma, just conjugation by gamma. Um, mm -hmm. If it was that easy, they wouldn't pay us the big bucks, right? But you also have to include the, the co-cycle in some fairly, I don't know, maybe non-intuitive ways just to make sure that everything is, is still multiplicative. And then moreover, we were able in some cases to identify not just the vial groupoid, but the vial twist. So if we've got a, if we have a continuous section of this groupoid quotient here, so G, uh, section S going from G mod S up back up to G, then we get a continuous section of the vial groupoid. So a map psi S from the vial groupoid up to the vial twist. And if you were paying really good attention 30 minutes ago, you might remember that I said, anytime we've got a continuous section of the vial groupoid, that means that this, this twist here is actually just given by a two co-cycle. So and the formula for the two co-cycle comes from this continuous section psi S, which in turn came from this continuous section S. So let me briefly comment on some possible future directions we might go in. Um, throughout this talk and throughout these papers, we were focusing on twists that came from two co-cycles. So what can we do if we don't have twists that come from two co-cycles, if we're actually working with the, the principal circle bundles? Um, it's also, it's known that there are Carton subalgebras in groupoid C star algebras that don't satisfy all of those very long hypotheses from our first theorem, right? You need um, maximal among abelian subgroupoids on which the co-cycle is trivial and immediately centralizing. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff there. And so there's other Carton subalgebras and can we do anything in that situation? And of course, I didn't put this on the slide, but uh, we were starting with a groupoid G that was et al. You can build groupoid C star algebras from non et al groupoids and what can we do with that? So thank you very much for listening. And here's some various references as well. As I said, the, the papers where these results are, are given in, in all of their computational details are here and then, yeah, more references. And this is the original paper by Renault. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, so, are there uh, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. So, um, in the case of the um, of the cycle on Z two, mm -hmm. uh, you identified a, a subgroup which leads to a Cartan subalgebra inside of the twisted group algebra, right? Yeah. So. What can you say about a, a general twisted group? Suppose you have any general twisted group. Can you always find a subgroup which leads to a Cartan subalgebra? Probably not. But in that case, would you be able to identify conditions uh, when that, that, that such a thing exists? Mm -hmm. Well, so we have some conditions here, right? That um, we need. I guess I guess I'm asking how do you interpret this theorem in 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 term, in, in a group? Right. Okay. So you would first need to find um, an abelian to interpret this theorem, and I think we use all of the hypotheses, but of course, the only one that we know for sure is actually 
but I, there's a lot of hypotheses and interplay between them, so I don't know that they're all necessary. But first you would find an abelian subgroup of your group and make sure that the co-cycle is symmetric on it, and that will guarantee that the C star algebra of that abelian group with the co-cycle is abelian. You need to make sure that that group is immediately centralizing so that the C star algebra of the group is actually maximal abelian. To have the, the normalizers generate the C star algebra, you need the subgroup to be normal. So a normal abelian subgroup, which is maximal, which is uh, immediately centralizing. And then to get the conditional expectation from the big group C star algebra onto the little one, you need it to be, um, you need it to be clopin. Which it will be. Always right. If, if G is discrete, then that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, nice. So that's just an, an easy interpretation of your main theorem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for letting me, giving me a second chance to explain that better. Uh, there are some generalizations that are, well, quite natural. You could look into Roy X's theory of these, um, well, Cartan subalgebras, where the subalgebra is not commutative. Mm. Uh, then probably the whole isotropy could be used if it's closed and so on. Have you looked into these possibilities already? We haven't done anything with um, looking at, at non-abelian Cartan subalgebras, no, but thank you for the suggestion. I think that's, that's an excellent one. And well, when I talked to one of my students, I suggested he might also look at the non-Hausdorff situation. Or if it's not clopen, that is, then, well, uh, this groupoid that you would make probably is a non hausdorff groupoid, and so you run into these difficulties. And it's no longer Cartan in the sense of the no, but something more general. Did you also start looking into this, or nothing yet? So nothing yet. I will say I'm the the follow up project that I'm currently working on with John Brown. Um, we are looking at. Um, subalgebras that are not necessarily Cartan in the sense that they're maximal abelian, but uh, John with, with Rui actually, and uh, Adam Fuller and David Pitts and Sarah Resnikoff, they have, um, they've looked at, at a more general notion of sort of Cartan-like subalgebras where you've got a Cartan subalgebra B inside of A, and then A is a fixed point algebra for a group action inside of D, and then you look at this entire relationship, B inside A inside D, um, and can we find a nice characterization? They, so um, John et al. have found a groupoid description of the algebra D that contains this Cartan subalgebra, and, and so John and I are trying to look at, can we get some nice if we started, if D was already a groupoid C star algebra, can we again get a nice relationship between the um, Brown Fuller Pitts Resnikoff groupoid that they construct from this, this Cartan tower type structure and the, um, the groupoid that we started with? And John, in, in those discussions with John, um, John has said that he thinks requiring S. Um, somehow there, we are being too strict with our requirements on S, right? Because it's, we don't really need S to be maximal among abelian subgroupoids of ISO. It should be maximal among abelian subgroupoids of the interior of ISO. Because if we're focusing on the topologically principal case, then you don't really care about all of ISO you just care about a dense set inside ISO. And so you really just want interior of ISO. Um, I don't, so that was a very long answer to your question, Ralph. Um, but yeah. I, the, the more, the more uh, to the point answer, I think is that I am not touching a Hausdorff situation with a 10 foot pole at the moment, a, a non-Hausdorff situation with a 10 foot pole. So if your student is braver than me, then please, I, it's all his. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Thanks.
Are there any other questions? Uh, Fernando, please. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Fernando. Um, the notion you introduced is immediately centralized. Do you have more examples in the case of groups? I mean, if the group is a free group, there is an obvious immediately centralizing sub subset. But uh, do you have more, because you gave examples of abelian groups, um, it's, and I see it for the first time in the context of groups. And so do you have other examples, intuition on that notion? Um, we don't. We came up with, the way we came up with this condition, because I hadn't seen it in the literature either, is we, we mm -hmm. realized that we needed this condition to make our theorem work. And I asked Caleb Eckhart, who has done a fair bit of work on group C star algebras, if he had seen a condition like this anywhere. And then I later gave a talk to a group theory audience and had they seen this condition anywhere. And um, at least with our original formulation of the condition, which as I said, is a bit messier. It didn't really show up in the literature as far as we could tell. Um, Caleb is the one who pointed us in the direction of uh, this unique root property of um, Bomslag. Mm -hmm. But I don't have other examples. So in the context of the free group, it's not clear what is immediately centralizing except the unit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there is no. Um, I don't think about free groups as often as you do. And so I, I don't know, <laughs> but um, yeah, it shouldn't, famous last words, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what happens in the free group case, but I, I haven't thought about it. Okay. You no, know, I Thanks. think I think that there is a uh, a strong relationship between that condition and the condition ICC. of ICC exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Formally, yeah. there is some relation, yeah, which I gives mean, you the the factor property of of group uh, von Neumann algebras. Exactly. So, but it's it's a nice it's a nice relation. I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's similar, but I think I think it's not quite the same as, as ICC. No, no, but yeah. somehow formally, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Wouldn't would, would it just be the fact that, uh, I mean, if you have a, a group G in a, in a normal subgroup S, wouldn't the immediately centralizing property simply mean that the quotient uh, group is ICC? Could be. Um, Good point. Yeah, I'm getting in on, on the run, but it, it seems reasonable. I would have to sit down and write that down, but that would. It, thank you, Roy, for suggesting that. If that's true, that will make this look a lot more sexy and less complicated. So I like that. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. So. Uh, I wanted to ask a, a question. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> so have you tried to use groupoid this groupoid descriptions of sister algebras uh, to together with Boundcon uh, uh, in order to compute the K theory? So can it happen that say, I mean, the same sister algebra has two groupoid models and uh, for one groupoid, the uh, bound conjecture uh, fails and for the other, it doesn't. And then you compute it. And, I mean, have, have you thought about this kind of, of thing? I have not. Um... I think I would be surprised if the BOMCON conjecture failed for one picture, but uh, was true for the other picture, but it might be that it's more computable in one, in one picture than the other one. But I have not thought about the BOMCON conjecture very seriously in several years. So I, um, yeah, but I, I think that's a very good question. Also, because um we have this nice um 
crossed product type picture of the vial groupoid. And so that might help to understand the, the Bonkon conjecture, right? Especially maybe if we start with a group. So as we saw in the rotation algebra case, right? If you start with a group, then its vial groupoid is no longer a group, but it's, it's a cross product type groupoid. Um, and, and so could be that things are easier to compute in one direction or the other, but I, yeah. Thank you for asking. So my immediate thought would be that there is some kind of iterated cross product structure here. So you uh, have, you are computing a, well, the, the whole C style of G is uh, a C style of a groupoid extension where this S is some kind of normal subgroupoid bundle. And then you are taking a cross product first by S and then by G mod S. Mm -hmm. And since S is kind of very abelian, I think BaumCon for that is probably very automatically true. And um, so I would guess that if you now have, well, I'm not sure whether people have found results about Baumcon for extensions of groupoids. I know that Echterhoff, Schaber have done something about this in the group case. I think the groupoid case would well probably be just someone sitting down and doing the work if, it's, if it isn't done already. Um, so from that point of view, the Baumcon conjecture for G for the C star G C should be equivalent to Baumcon for G mod S with coefficients uh, uh, so that the two Baumcon conjectures ought to be equivalent in this case, as you already guessed. Yeah. So I know uh, Christian Bonica, who last I heard is a was a postdoc at in Glasgow, and he did his PhD with Siegfried Echterhoff. I know that he looked at an extension of the Chaber Echterhoff Oyono work to uh, the groupoid setting, uh, and he was able to make it work for ample groupoids. Um, I am guessing that this has been published, but I don't know the reference. Yeah, but I remember Christian that. would be the person I'd ask. Yeah, that's the first one to, to check. And I think also Valerio Proietti had reason to do some such things, maybe together with Makoto Yamashita, I think they did something. Well, they were interested in male spaces and groupoids coming from that, but they also had some reason to do some general theory, I think. So there have been some people recently looking at kind of Baumcon for groupoids and the formalities of it like okay. these permanence properties stuff and so on. Um, I think more could be done there, but it's, well, also it's not really stuff you would get famous with, I guess, because it's not surprising if you do it. Um, so you need applications for it. You have a, must have a reason to actually do it. And then people uh, tend to do exactly what they need and nothing more. Yeah. And but, it would be complicated and technical, I suspect. Groupoids always make everything three times as technical. Could be, yes. Um, but, yeah, especially, well, the ample case, that was probably because it was good enough and easier. So the Ital case is also possible. Although there are some actual issues if you have kind of open but not closed subgroupoids, they really cause differences. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that Valerio Proietti needed exactly these uh, more general things and so did it. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, suppose you have a, a, a sister algebra with a Cartan sub algebra. Uh, is there a way of phrasing uh, what the answer, I mean, to compute the K theory of, of the algebra, uh, Baucon, if it holds, gives you some description. Can one, is, is there a nice way of describing this description, interpreting this description in terms of the algebra and the Cartan sub algebra without mentioning the groupoid? I mean, this would be the, the good I, I think it's an excellent question, but I, I don't know. Um, Ralph, I mean, do you have any insight on that? Well, if you start, if you want to look at BaumCon, then the first thing you see is the universal proper action, at least in the usual formulation. 
so there certainly the group work plays a big role. If you would yeah. follow the approach I did with Richard Ness, you would look at the category of group wide actions and find some kind of, well, some kind of localization inside. But again, the group wide through its actions is yeah. the first thing you need. Yeah, of course. But but then you might be able to identify, I mean, it might be, I mean, the group mm -hmm. point depends on B and A and B, right? So anything yes. that depends on the group point could be theoretically be phrased mm -hmm. in terms of A and B. And so, I don't know. Yes. Um, thought. You, now if, if I- successful in, in doing so, then you might be able to extend uh, at least the conjecture to inclusions of C-star algebras. Yeah, that doesn't sound plausible that this would work. Also in this, if I think about computational tools like spectral sequences, I think if you, well, if you assume that you have a kind of sufficiently print, let's take a principle group right, to avoid torsion completely. I think even if it's topologically principle, maybe the torsion isn't big enough to have kind of to, uh, so that I think that all um, proper actions might already be free and proper. And then the prediction for Baumcon would say that you get the K homology of the classifying space of your groupoid, K homology of BG. And that's kind of the same as groupoid homology up to a spectral sequence computation. So you would get into this groupoid homology. Um, and this doesn't look very well, very close to this algebras A and B that you started with. Um, so I don't think this is very plausible. In particular, because I mean, one of the, the things that has come out of this work, um, which again, I think was probably already known, not so surprising, is that if you've got a C-star algebra and you know it's a groupoid C-star algebra, there's no necessary uniqueness for the groupoid. Um, there's uniqueness in Renault's setting if you have a Carton subalgebra and if you know that your groupoid, and if you require like this topologically principal and etal conditions. But in in general, knowing the groupoid is um, the groupoid's not immediately recoverable from the C star algebra, and you can have multiple groupoids give you the same C star algebra. So if the K theory is really best understood from the, the groupoid perspective, then you're losing information if you try to say it all in terms of the C star algebra. Well, but uh, if you only consider the, I mean, as, as you pointed out, Reynolds theorem gives a uniqueness. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the Cartan pair is the groupoid. Yes. So. Yeah. so if you have a Cartan pair, it's regular. So in some sense, they have all these uh, bisections of the groupoid floating around because in the inclusion, you find these subspaces and they act by partial homeomorphisms on the unit space. Probably you can do something key theoretic about that. Let's say in the ample case to make things simple, uh, you could look at compact open bisection like things so that you really have homeomorphisms between compact open subsets of the groupoid. Uh, this is kind of sitting inside your inclusion. If you are willing to talk about that, really, then you already have the groupoid almost there. Maybe you don't have the twist and everything, but we have a lot of the structure. Um, 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 if you do have that, then maybe you can succeed, but then you are already very close to the group point in the end. So maybe that wouldn't be so exciting. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, then you don't, well, you need to encode that your inclusion is regular. So these slices are, are an important part of the structure. Okay. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we could uh, stop at least stop the recording.